thank you. Hey, Jesus. Hey, Eza. Hey, Eza. Hey, Eza. Hey, Eza. Hey, 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 thank you very much. Thank you. My dear comrades, members, supporters, sympathizers, and followers of the National Democratic Congress, the good people of Ghana watching and listening from across the country and the world, and those who have joined us here in Winneba, Professor Jane Nana Upukwa Jiman my running mate for the 2024 election, the Right Honorable Speaker, Alban Bagbin, a bona fide member of our party, my beloved wife, Lodina, my dear children who are here with me, Sharaf Shahid, Farida, thank you, I acknowledge you. Our National Chairman, Johnson Asie Dunketia. Our General Secretary, Fifi Tiavikwete. Our traditional rulers who have been so kind to join us here today. Our members of the Council of Elders who, despite age, have managed with their walking sticks to join us this morning. Party supporters, ladies and gentlemen. Today we gather with hope as one people, united in victory, and as one nation, Ghana, with a common interwoven invisible destiny. Today we also gather to reignite and reaffirm the dreams of our forebears, led by Osajipo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the founder of our great nation, a nation A nation with one destiny, a destiny that cannot afford to endure one additional day beyond January 7, 2025, of the maladministration, the mismanagement and state capture this nation has been subjected to over the last almost eight years. For the sake of God's children and in the name of God, the people of Ghana will wake up from this nightmare and envision a bright new dawn of opportunities for all its people and not just a few. My brothers and sisters, our dear nation Ghana is bleeding. Ghana's soul is calling for change. Mother Ghana is crying for its true and genuine patriotic citizens to rise up to reset our beloved nation. Ghanaians can take no more of the hardship, the impunity, the state capture, the hypocrisy, the lies and bad governance that has been inflicted on them over the two terms of this outgoing administration. We cannot fail Mother Ghana, and therefore I urge you all to vote for change on December 7, 2024. We, the members of the National Democratic Congress, have gathered here to express our utmost belief in democratic governance and to proclaim right here in Winneba, also called SIMPA, that the time is up for this administration. The time is up for them to go. They have decimated our democracy beyond recognition. They've destroyed livelihoods and families and pushed millions of our people below the poverty line. Your vote on December 7th will end the tyranny, it will end the cronyism, it will end the corruption, it will end the hardship. It will also pave the way for the vision, experience and trustworthiness. And I, John Dramani Mahama, is going to restore that to the Flagstaff House. As I've said before, this government must begin writing their handing over notes if they have not started doing so already. This MPP administration has been the biggest political scam that has been pulled on Ghanaians since our independence in 1957. 
and I'll explain why. They were repackaged with ribbons and sweetly scented with enticing promises. Most Ghanaians will agree that Nana Akufuado is indeed the president Ghana never got. And indeed, I dare say, his much touted economic waste kit, Vice President Dr. Ba Mahmoud Baumia, is also the economic messiah Ghana never got. The MPP government took over from our administration on 7 January 2017. They inherited an energy sector we had stabilized with the fastest mobilization of emergency power of almost 800 megawatts in the history of Ghana. Along with this came a new energy sector levy act, which we call ESLA, with potential revenues of 3 billion Ghana cities every year to pay off legacy energy sector debts. They inherited an ongoing Millennium Challenge Compact of $547 million aimed at making Ghana's energy sector the most efficient in Africa. This family, ruling family, quarreled over the shares in the PDS, com PDS company and led to the U.S. pulling back $190 million, which was meant for the most critical component of the compact, and that is private sector participation and improvement in collections at the distribution end of the electricity value chain. They inherited more than $450 million of the IMF extended credit facility initiated by my administration. Most of our state-owned enterprises were breaking even or making a profit. We handed that to them. They inherited a cocoa production of more than 960,000 metric tons of cocoa, with a cocoa board that was making profit and owed only 1.5 billion CDs to the central bank in cocoa bills. We handed over to them two new oil producing wells, the Ten Fields and the ENI Sankofa, which increased Ghana's oil production by more than 100,000 barrels per day, with additional gas of more than 200 million standard cubic feet per day. And this increased Ghana's oil revenues uh, uh, revenues from petroleum by more than half a billion dollars every year. <clears throat> they took over from our administration a stabilization fund in which we had accrued $277 million. A Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund received money of $270 million. A sinking fund account at the Bank of Ghana with a balance of over $200 million. They inherited a budget that ran a deficit of 6.1%, with zero borrowing from the central bank, the Bank of Ghana, zero borrowing. They inherited a stable currency that traded at about four CDs to one dollar. Inflation was at 15.4%. Unemployment was at 8.4%. And when we handed over the administration of this country to the Akufuado Baumia government, Ghana's debt as a percentage of our GDP was 56%. As a result of fiscal consolidation, we handed over an economy that was set to grow above 8%, as predicted by the World Bank and IMF and all the credit rating agencies. Private businesses enjoyed an enabling environment to thrive and foreign investors were queuing to make investments in our economy. The MPP government also took off with a stabilized economy and significant buffers with enormous domestic and internal goodwill. Indeed, this has been the most favored government in our history. But alas, the Ghanaian people's favor, their goodwill, has been repaid with only pain and anguish. This government has received more revenue than all governments combined in the history of Ghana. And as the saying goes, to whom much is given, much is expected. Unfortunately, the people of Ghana have been severely shortchanged by this administration. The scorecard of this administration has been abysmal. 
an inflation rate that went as high as 54% and is currently still hovering above 20%. Ghana today has one of the highest food inflation rates in the whole of Africa. We have a currency that has depreciated to almost 16 cities to 1 US dollar and we borrowed more than 70 billion from the central bank, the Bank of Ghana, causing a serious upsurge in inflation and causing the Bank of Ghana to go broke. We have a debt to GDP that went as high as 104%. And today, the unemployment rate is almost 15% from just above 8% in 2016. Worst of all, Ghana has defaulted on her debt payments and has therefore engaged in a debt exchange that has resulted in painful haircuts and they have deferred the tenure of bonds at lower interest rates. This has caused a lot of trouble for investors including pensioners. Cocoa production, which has been one of the mainstay of our economy, has plummeted and for the first time in the history of our country, the Cocoa Board Annual Syndication, which was soft, sought after by 150,000 tons of cocoa to next year. It means that your government and, and Cocoa Board is seeking to delay delivery of almost 350,000 tons of cocoa to next year. It means that your government, NDC, is the one going to have to find the 350,000 to fill that hole, to pay the debt. Cocoa Board has also defaulted on almost 13 billion Ghana cities in cocoa bonds. Oil and gas production has declined by 32%, and debt to independent power producers has increased astronomically. Today, the majority of state-owned enterprises are posting massive losses. The COVID pandemic, rather than being an adversity, turned out to be a bless blessing with a windfall for this government of almost 25 billion Ghana cities of inflows, most of which were doled out to companies owned by family and friends. The majority of our citizens are convinced that our country, Ghana, is going in the wrong direction. Faith in our democracy is at its lowest, and many of our youth do not believe that constitutional governance is working for them. Faith in our democratic institutions and the political leadership is at its lowest ebb, and corruption is at its highest, and Ghanaians have become numb to the scandals that are exposed almost every week. And, you are, and when you have a president who says he does not understand the halabaloo, <laughs> my brothers and sisters, this is a president who just doesn't get it. Many domestic and foreign investors have adopted a wait and see attitude. Many of them I have met have told me that they are waiting for a signal from the Ghanaian people that the political and business environment is going to change for the better, that we're going to effect a change of course so that we can provide a reasonable environment for them to put in their investments. Ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Book in Matthew 25, 14, 30 tells one of the parables of Jesus Christ. And this is the parable of the talents. This parable teaches us to invest whatever is put in our care wisely for the benefit of our master. The master in this case is the people of Ghana. This administration is just like the last of the servants who buried his talents that was given to him by his master. And when his master came, he returned the one talent to him. But in this case of Akufuadu and Baumia and their cabal, they did not bury the one talent and give us back our one talent when we returned. They gambled with the talents that we gave them and they landed the people of Ghana in a huge debt. We cannot continue on this path. 
Lessons must be learned from the experience of these last almost eight years. A vote for the MPP will be an expression of satisfaction with the impunity of the last eight years. A vote for the MPP is a vote for a third term for Nana Akufuadu. A vote for the MPP in this election is a vote to escape accountability. It is a vote to allow officials who have stolen and raped this country's resources to escape accountability and go laughing all the way to their bank accounts. Ladies and gentlemen, their flag bearer and his running mate, who have been prominent actors in this horror movie Ghanaians have watched these last almost eight years. You know horror movies, don't you? Their flag bearer and his running mate, who have been prominent actors in the horror movies Ghanaians have watched these almost last eight years. These people cannot be the ones to exact accountability from the government of which they have been an integral part. We are at a critical juncture in our democratic history. Choices we make in elections come with consequences. We cannot afford to fail this time. A restive youthful population does not have the luxury of trial and error. They do not have the luxury of trying a driver's mate who has learned his driving skills from the same driver who crashed the Ghanaian vehicle of state. Our nation needs a reset. Our democracy needs a reset. Our economy needs a reset. Our governance needs a reset. And our attitudes need a reset. We need a government that will galvanize the efforts of all Ghanaians, irrespective of ethnicity, religion, or party affiliation. We need a government that will allow all businesses to thrive, whether owned dom by domestic investors or foreign investors, no matter their ethnic, religious, or partisan colors of its owner. We need to make a change, a change that will usher in a government that is responsible and accountable. We need to open up this country for business again. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to present to you our manifesto. We need a leadership that will crack the ship when its own appointees go down the wrong track. We need a responsive government that will respect the rights and freedoms of our citizens, including journalists, and address the ongoing decay of state institutions and fight corruption by deploying the operation Recover All the Loot Principle. <laughs> operation Recover All the Loot Strategy and that is O-R-A-L. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're presenting to you a manifesto that will help take back your future, take the future of Ghana back into the hands of the Ghanaian people. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will at this point give you some highlights of our manifesto, after which my running mate and by God's grace, the next Vice President of the, Ga uh, the Republic of Ghana, <laughs> Professor J. Nana Opokwa Jimang, a prominent daughter of the Central Region, and other presenters will delve into other areas of the manifesto. 
ladies and gentlemen, first is resetting the economy for prosperity. In the first 120 days in office, we will hold a national economic dialogue to draw up a four-year fiscal consolidation plan. We would rationalize taxes, abolishing, among others, the obnoxious e-levy the COVID levy, and the 10% levy on bets winnings. We will review import duties and levies on vehicles and equipment meant for industrial and agricultural purposes. Ladies and gentlemen, we will rationalize port fees and charges and implement emergency measures to stabilize the city and the macroeconomic environment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we will use the price stabilization and recovery levy to cushion customers, uh, consumers of petroleum products. We will investigate the MPP's opaque gold, gold for oil deal. We will review the gold purchase program of the Bank of Ghana and will restore the licenses of wrongly, wrongfully collapsed banks and financial institutions. We will increase indigenous participation in the banking and financial sector and we will free the statutory funds, the GET Fund, NHIL, road fund to be able to achieve their mandated objectives. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, alleviating the current economic hardships. And one of our first projects, programs, is the no fee stress policy. <laughs> there are many students who are unable to take up their places in tertiary educational institutions because they cannot afford to pay their academic user fees, their academic fees. And so we'll take that stress off them. For the first year, they will not be required to pay fees. And I assure the universities, it will not affect their internal generated funds. We're going to give the money to the student's loan. The student loan will pay it to the universities as a grant. It will be paid as a grant, not as a loan. And aside from that, we're going to increase the subvention that goes to our public universities so that we can improve quality and learning in those universities. We will provide free tertiary education for all persons with disability. And we will provide free sanitary parts for girls in school. If you remember, Nana Jane started that policy with a World Bank facility, and they called that loan the PAD loan. Yes, we are proud of the PAD loan. It will allow our young girls who are going through their periods to be neat and hygienic and not to miss school, be able to go to school all year round. We will uncap the national health insurance levy. Currently, there's a cap on the levy, and so a certain portion of the levy goes into the consolidated fund. And so the health insurance authority is not able to pay the health facilities, reimburse them for the services that they provide. We will uncap the health insurance so that all the national health insurance levy will go into the national health insurance fund so that they can pay the hospitals for looking after our people. And of course, this is associated with it. We will reprioritize the health sector by ensuring timely releases of payment to service providers. We established the Ghana Medical Care Trust, into brackets, somebody calls it Mahama Cares, to support persons with chronic diseases such as kidney failure, 
cancer, sickle cell, diabetes, hypertension, and other health-related diseases. Ezu, Ezu. We'll also in introduce the community pharmacy concept, and that will encourage people to go to your local pharmacy and go have your blood pressure taken and your sugar checked so that if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, we're able to know early so that you can get treatment and be able to survive. We'll implement, we'll implement free primary health care services. So if you go to a CHIPS compound or a health center, whether you have a national health insurance card or not, you will be treated for free. And so from the health center level down, polyclinic, health center, CHIPS compound, if you go, you will be uh, treated for free. From the district uh, referral hospital upward, uh, your national health insurance card, and you will receive treatment. We will expand health infrastructure to restore the automatic em employment and timely deployment of health workers. And so we're not going to wait till elections are coming and announce that we've opened the recruitment portal. The recruitment portal will be open and we'll do continuous employment of health workers, doctors, and nurses. We need a first-class children's hospital in Ghana. The existing ch uh, children's hospital has, has outlived this usefulness. And so we're going to construct a state-of-the-art 500-bed specialist children's hospital in Accra. And so children who have sicknesses that cannot be handled in other parts of the country will come to Accra. There will be specialist pediatricians there to give them the care they deserve. Of course, we will expand, we will construct a state of the art, I've said that one. We'll also contract a fertility center. There are a lot of mothers who cannot have children just because there's something wrong with their reproductive system. It can be corrected and they can have babies and enjoy the joy of motherhood. But currently, the prices that the private fertility hospitals charge are out of the range of most mothers. And so government will step in, will build a fertility center where mothers who want children can come for consultation and they will be giving the treatment so that they also can enjoy the joy of motherhood. I'll go quickly. We'll expand the facilities at the whole teaching hospital in order that it can provide specialist services and also be a quaternary hospital to serve the University of Health and Allied Sciences. In the whole of the OT corridor up to the northeastern part of the country, there's no trauma hospital. And so we'll build a trauma hospital there so that persons who are involved in accidents on the eastern corridor road will have a place where they can be treated properly before they are transferred. We'll establish modern dialysis centers in hospitals in regions that don't have them. Currently, most of Upper West, my own hometown, Bole, and other places, if you have a kidney uh, ailment, the only place you can go for treatment is in Kumasi. And you have to go with your wife, your family, you have to find a place to stay, it is a burden. And so we want to make sure that every region has a modern dialysis center so that we can ease the burden on persons with kidney ailments. We will build modern hospitals in Boko, Yendi, and other underserved areas. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this is the training.
This is the 24-hour economic clock. One job, three shifts, three people. One, three, three. One job, three shifts, three people. Obiabe Didi. Ezu. Extraordinary problems require extraordinary solutions for extraordinary results. And so businesses and public organizations will be encouraged to operate 24 7 in three shifts of eight hours each. This will boost production. It will increase employment and provide well-paying jobs. It will transform Ghana into an import substitution and export-led country. It will increase employment opportunities and revenue, and it will enhance access to public services. We will focus on some selected public institutions that have huge customer traffic. For instance, the ports and harbors should be open 24-7. That means we have to employ more workers at the port. We have to employ more customs officers, more GAPOHA uh, workers, more forklift operators and all that. We need customs. Customs should work 24-7, three shifts, so that at any time your items come, customs at any time of the day is open for business. You can go and process your uh, import things uh, papers and take your things out of the port. We must have a passport office that is operating longer than eight hours so that people who need passports and other site documentation can have access to it. We must have a DVLA that is working more shifts than one shift so that more people can get their licenses processed in a shorter time than the current waiting time. In the private sector, the sectors that we are looking to promote and encourage to run 24-7 and three shifts are first the agro-processing center sector. That is those who will process our cassava into cassava starch, cassava flour, gari, and all that. There's a huge market in Africa for all these products and in other parts of the world. Manufacturing, that is industry. Manufacturing, that is industry. And so the textiles industry, the fruits, uh, juice making industry, all the industries, the iron and steel industry, will be encouraged to run 24-7. The pharmaceutical se 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 sector. We want Ghana to be the pharmaceutical hub of the whole of Africa, so that we'll produce medicines here and export them to all other African countries. Construction sites. We want our construction companies to work 24-7 all year, uh, all hours round, so that they can deliver our infrastructure faster than they currently do. Financial services, the same. Sanitation and garbage collection. It is better to collect garbage, baller, in the night, rather than collect the baller and be competing with cars in the daytime when we have rush hour traffic. Extractive industries. The mines, mining bauxite, mining gold, mining manganese, lithium, they must work 24-7, three shifts every day. Hospitality industry, our restaurants, our uh, 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 discotheques, our nightclubs, our hotels, 24-7, 24 hours a day. Retail centers, all the malls, there's no reason why you should start. People can come in the nighttime and buy items. So they should work longer than eight hours. Transportation services, there should be buses running 24 hours so that people who have to go to their jobs can be able to get a bus to go to their jobs. Security services, we need safety and security to be able to implement the 24-hour economy. And so we need more, more police officers, we need more soldiers, we need more prison officers, more fire service officers, more customs, more immigration. Ezu. 
Now, the support package for 24-hour businesses is to stimulate demand for 24-hour economy goods and services. And this will be supported by strategic investments in infrastructure, in security, in energy. We'll have public and private security architecture, cheaper and reliable electricity. That is the time of use tariff. So in the night when we're not using much of the power and it's going to waste, we can supply it to the 24-hour economy enclave at cheaper rates than we currently charge. Tax incentives to companies that will sign up for the 24-hour economy, they'll be given tax incentives so they pay lower taxes, so they can reinvest invest what they have saved back into increasing their production. We'll give them support from the Ghana Exim Bank, especially for the agro-processing and manufacturing sectors that are going to be exporting. We'll support SMEs operating um, uh, capacity with catalytic investments to upgrade and generate jobs. The Accelerated Export Development Council. I'm going to chair that personally. We want to accelerate our exports. We're going to register more Ghanaian goods on the African continental free trade area so that we can export to other countries. And I'm going to chair that personally. And we'll meet every month and appraise where we are at in terms of encouraging Ghanaian businesses to export. This Accelerated Export Development Council will promote exports under the 24-hour economy. My running mate will talk more about this, so I will jump it. Women's Development Bank. Um, It will give low-interest low loans, particularly to women's uh, businesses. She'll talk more about it, so let's jump in. The National Apprenticeship Program will be for self-employment, and it will also help people who have come out of school at different levels, who want to go and learn a skill, but their parents are unable to pay the masters for them to go and learn. The government, through the district assemblies, is going to register all master craftsmen we're going to pay them and assign these young people to them so that they can learn a skill to go into the world of work. Um, next slide. Free technical and vocational training for young people. The time for drama, uh, grammar school education has passed. The time where you were judged by the long grammar you could speak has passed. We now need more technicians, more mechanics, more plumbers, more artisans. And so, we are going to shift our focus from grammar school and build more technical and vocational educational schools so that our children who leave free SHS, who leave JHS and unable to continue can go and train as apprentices and be graduated with certificates. We will provide them with startup capital to be able to start their own small businesses. We will also use NVTI to train and test them so that they can get their certificates to enter the world of work. We have what we call the Jumara program. And this, this is the entrepreneurial program. Nobody says you must finish school and become an employee. You can finish school and become an employer and employ employees. And so every year we want to target 10,000 youth entrepreneurs to set up their own businesses, we'll mentor them, we'll monitor them, we'll supervise them until they're able to stand on their own feet and they will employ their colleagues instead of becoming empl empl employee employees. Business development. We exempt new and small businesses, that is small and medium enterprises, new and small businesses that are registered and personal income tax of those businesses from the first two years after they are incorporated. So if you are a young person under this program and you set up your business, for two years you won't pay any corporate income tax. You start paying after two years. Because we want the business to be able to get a grounding and be able to stand on its feet before they start paying taxes. We we'll review the Customs Amendment Act to scrap the ban on salvage vehicles. Not everybody can afford a new vehicle. And so their vehicles in good shape, they must have had a small accident. We have young people in the magazine who are repairing these vehicles. If we say we're banning these vehicles, we're throwing those young people out of work. And so we we'll allow salvage vehicles to come in so that other people can buy vehicles at affordable rates. 
And if we do this, it will save the local automotive industry. And so the Swami Magazine, the Kokom Pays, the Aboso Kinds will continue to do their business even as we set up an automobile industry. We'll support the redevelopment of Kokompe, Abuso Kai, and all those magazines so that it creates a more congenial environment for people to come and do uh, business. We'll implement a Made in Ghana agenda for the production and consumption of Made in Ghana goods. Government is going to use its budget to buy Made in Ghana goods first. It's only when you can't get that good that you'll be allowed to buy a foreign product. If the good is produced in Ghana, you must buy it first. And so we're going to use government's financial muscle to encourage local production of goods and services. If you are, an, if you are a foreign uh, industry and you want us to buy your goods, come and establish the factory here and produce what you want us to buy here. We will launch an export Ghana policy. And it is the Accelerated Economic Development Council that is going to oversee this export uh, Ghana, export Ghana policy. And we're going to use that policy to facilitate exports and the African continental free trade area and also the ECOWAS trade liberalization. We will enhance the role of the Ghana Exim Bank in financing non-traditional exports. We will readjust their focus so that they are putting money into uh, uh, industries that are uh, exporting. products so that we can give them capital at a cheaper rate your Pension a week, 50, when it gets to their turn for retirement, they have some money that they can rely on. We'll also, this pension scheme will cover commercial drivers and my uh, dear Okada riders. They will also be part of the pension scheme. It will also be extended to small scale miners, farmers, fishermen, traders, and market women. People who receive cash on a daily basis. You put a little aside, if it's every week, you go and pay it into the money. Or you can use your mobile phone and pay, and your account will keep being updated. So after 15 years, that money has been invested. When you are retiring, you have your pot of uh, money so that you can be getting a pension every month in your old age. Uh, digital jobs initiatives. We'll partner the private sector to invest $3 billion to leverage ICT for jobs. And this will be through the 1 million coders program. We announced this in 2020, and we didn't win power, so we couldn't implement it. Somebody lifted it from our 2020 manifesto and uh, quickly put it out as if it was yes. As I said, go and look in 2020, you see that we had already put it there. But we will continue with our 1 million coders uh, program to train 1 million uh, people in coding and web development, software engineering, and others. We will stimulate demand for made in Ghana software. We are exporting a lot of hard currency. When we import goods, we know that we are sending foreign currency out to buy those goods. When we import uh, uh, food, we are sending money out to buy that food. But when we send money out to pay copyright to Microsoft, to Oracle, to all the people whose software we are running on our banks and all our online portals and all that, nobody sees it. And so if we are going to uh, uh, train one million coders to do software, web hosting and all that, we must create a demand for it locally. And so government will first see if we have the available software in-house before we allow anybody to buy software from outside. And so um, we we'll exchange payments for subscriptions to overseas vendors. We we'll establish regional digital centers for business process outsourcing. Um, business process outsourcing is when you sit in Ghana 
and you get a contract from abroad to do a certain job, you're able to do it from here without being physically there. And so you can process parking tickets in New York, you can process various items that they want. At times when they have gone to bed, they need somebody to be taking calls and responding to clients. They sometimes outsource it to other countries. Ghana is a good center to take advantage of this because our English is even clearer than many of the other countries that are doing the business process outsourcing. So people want Ghana to expand. <laughs> Invest 50 million in a fintech growth fund to promote digital entrepreneurs. I announced this long ago when I met the fintech entrepreneurs. Set up zonal ICT parks to make Ghana the innovation, artificial intelligence, and cyber security center of Africa. Redevelop the Dawa ICT Park into a world center of excellence. Ghana's first flagship program for jobs will work with the private sector to make Ghana the hub for pharmaceutical production. I've announced this already. We want our pharmaceutical industry to export drugs to all other African countries and other places. We will develop an integrated aluminum industry for industrialization. We will invest in the production of plastics, fertilizers, and other synthetic materials here. Expansion of the automotive and vehicle assembly sector. With this one, government is going, if we budget to buy vehicles, we are going to buy vehicles that have been assembled in Ghana. We will not buy vehicles from outside and bring them in. So all those, who have set, uh, 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 all those who have set up automotive assembly plants here, if government needs vehicles every year, we're going to buy those vehicles from them, not from outside. We will promote light industrial manufacture, especially in the textiles and electronic products. Today I was speaking with an investor, and um, he was talking about the textiles industry. And I told him, I said, unfortunately, we're not producing our own cotton. And he said, you don't need to produce your own cotton now. You can import cotton from Burkina Faso. You can import both, uh, cotton from Benin and start your textile industry. And when you have started it, you can backward integrate it in your own cotton production. Brilliant idea. So I told him, on 8 January, I'll be in the office. Come, come and see me. And let's start working. <laughs> And so, we'll revamp the textile and cotton and allied industries. We'll set up agro-industrial zones in all regions. I've said this already. We'll, we'll get a site in every region. Government will clear the site. We'll develop the site. We'll bring water, electricity to the site. And any private sector developer who wants to produce agro to buy agro um, uh, products and process can come and get a land within the agro zo uh, processing zone and start his business so that he doesn't have to go so that he doesn't have to go and quarrel with families they'll sell him land uh, another person will come no the land was not for this one government will secure the land so that they can easily set up their businesses establish mini processing plants for cassava tomatoes uh, fruits set up cashew processing factories in bono Bono East and Ahafo, where we have the most cashew. You know, set up uh, ginger processing plants in OT. We look at the uh, comparative advantage of every region and we will set up the plants that suit that region. We are not doing one district, one factory. We are looking at every region's comparative advantage and we'll put in the processing capacity that will make use of their uh, products. <laughs> Facilitate the construction of 20 medium scale animal feed processing plants and revamp the collapsing poultry industry. One of the major inputs that goes into poultry and livestock is the feed. It is very expensive because we import a lot of it currently. If we're producing more of it, we can get a lower price for the feed. And so we'll set up 20 uh, uh, feed processing plants so that they can process and produce feed locally. One area is the Bono area. I know the Doma area, there's a lot of poultry We'll give poultry cages to all the young people who want to do poultry. Exim Bank will give them assistance to produce the, uh, uh, the uh, chicken 
We will produce uh, cold storage facilities and processing facilities so they can process their chicken and keep it in the cold storage facilities for, uh, ready for the market. Establish, oh you, it's gone. <laughs> okay. There's <laughs> agriculture for jobs. We want to make agriculture more attractive through modernization to ensure food security and job creation. We reduce food inflation to lower the high cost of living through our Agriculture for Economic Transformation uh, program. We'll roll out a Feed Ghana program, which is to boost food production, guarantee food security, and supply raw materials to industry. And this is my favorite pr uh, project, to establish farmer service centers in all agricultural production areas. And in each farmer service center, there will be tractors, there will be harvesters, there will be plows, there will be harrows, there will be planters, everything you need to do modernized farming. And our farmers are going to be registered within the catchment area of the farmer service center. And at the beginning of the year, you go to your farmer uh, the, the planting season, you go to your farmer service center, they will provide you with the services, give you the fertilizer, give you the improved seeds, plow for you, plant for you. And when you harvest and you sell your crops, you come and pay the cost of the inputs that they gave you. We'll, we'll create farm banks with agricultural zones to ease access to land and irrigation facilities for agricultural purposes and encourage young people to go into farming. We need to bring more of our land into irrigation because you know what happened this year. There was a drought in the north and parts of Bono region. For almost eight weeks, the rain didn't fall and so people have lost their crops. And so we'll go more for irrigation, even if small scale, boreholes, uh, we have the Volta River, all along the banks of the Volta River, we can develop irrigation facilities. Promoting good governance and combating corruption, remarkably reduce the size of government to 60 ministers. No more than 60 ministers. And so there'll be other things for other people to do. We all can be ministers. I know when I say 60 ministers, I say, yeah, but, you know, there are, I know there are people aiming to become ministers, but we all can be ministers. So we we'll choose 60 ministers, but others would have other assignments that they can do. Uh, address the benefit disparities between Article 71 holders. I've said this already. We have two public servants, Article 71, and then the others who are under the fair wages. And so we want to bridge the disparity between them so that all of us come under an independent emoluments committee and our salaries and emoluments are determined from the smallest watchman to the president who will determine our salaries and wages. A ruthless war against corruption. Operation Recover All the Loot. Oral. Ezu. Prohibit political appointees and the politically exposed persons, not only political appointees, political appointees and politically exposed persons and all seven public officials from purchasing state assets. So it's not only me who cannot buy a state asset, my wife, Lodina, cannot buy a state asset, my son, Sharaf, or Shahid, or Farida, cannot buy a state asset because they are politically exposed persons. Reopen investigations into major unresolved cases, including the Ayawasu West Wagombai election violence, the 2020 election killings, the unresolved murder of Ahmed Swale and Silas Wulochami. There are all these cases that occurred under this administration. They refused to investigate them. Even where they've investigated, they've refused to implement the reports. They've not paid any compensation to the persons who are affected. We're going to look at all that and we'll deal with it. Dedicate equitable attention to all levels of education. Improve free SHS. Improve the quality of food for our children. Cancel the double track so that all our children can go to school at the same time. We're going to provide dedicated and sustainable source of funding for free SHS. The problem with the free SHS is it has no dedicated funding. And so it's subject to the hazards of the budget. And often the consolidated fund does not release funds. And so children go hungry because the funds have not arrived. Um, decentralize the procurement of food for SHSs to boost local economies. The feeding grants will go to the schools, to the headmasters and the bezers. 
and they will go to the local market and buy the beans, the granuts, the rice, the cassava dough, the agbelima, the meat from the local market so that the town in which the school is uh, uh, located can also benefit uh, from, from, from that. It will also allow the headmasters to provide more nutritious foods than the current system. I said this already, implement a no academic uh, fees policy for level 100 students, no fee stress policy. We'll use 5G and low earth orbit systems to improve the quality of education across the country by extending course tutorials, uh, course tutorials to students everywhere. We have good masters in different schools. And so for us, perhaps the best mathematics master is in Wesley Girls. The best French teacher is in Ghana Secondary School. The best geography teacher is in uh, GSTS. Ghana Education Service will select these teachers and they will teach, they will be filmed teaching the course online. They will teach online and will upload this uh, uh, course content on YouTube. And so you can go on YouTube and download what you want. If it's mathematics, you download it. If it's geography, you download it. But at the same time, it will be available on demand. And because we're going to put Starlink satellite, internet satellite on every secondary school, the teachers can use the Starlink to show the children the demonstration by these teachers. And so you can be in Bumpurgu Secondary School. The best maths master in Wesley Girls will be teaching you because you'll be able to download his course material. We'll prob That's the Basintali boy. <laughs> we'll provide free tertiary education. I've said that already. We'll provide continuing students with financial assistance. We're going to reintroduce what we, were, we, we had started, which is the Student Loan Fund uh, Trust Fund Plus. It's a Student Loan Plus. And so it's an enhanced student loan. You'll get more money from the Student Loan Plus, And you only start paying when you get employment, when you leave school. Um, implement a bed for all. We have a bed for all program. Our tertiary institutions have huge lands that are not utilized. Normally when we want to build a university, we take a huge piece of land and after many years, part of the land is uh, still lying fallow and even people are encroaching on the land. And so we're going to sit with the universities and carve out a part of their land. And we're going to get the private sector We'll do a design of hostels. If you're interested in investing your money in the hostel, you will build the hostel, we'll regulate the charges, and you'll pay for the cost of it over a period of time, and you can make your profit. So that more of our children can have accommodation on campus. That is the bed for all program. The hostels will be built by the private sector. They will build it, they will charge the fees, but we'll sit with them and regulate the fees so that they are not too ex ex exorbitant. Um, what else? Uh, legislation to streamline and regulate the award of government scholarships. Government scholarships have been fraught with a lot of, uh, let me say, kalabule. We want to streamline it, and as I'm, I've said, persons with conflict of interest will not be allowed to apply for scholarships. I would not apply for a scholarship for my children. None of my ministers will do it. Any political appointee must not apply for scholarships. You must pay for yourself. Leave, leave the scholarships for the children of the underprivileged. Those who cannot afford it are the ones who must get the scholarships. And we're going to do that. We'll abolish teacher licensure exams. We'll abolish teacher licensure exams and integrate it into the licensing process in their final year exam. We'll institute the Teacher Dabre project. And what this means is that any new school we are building must be accompanied by accommodation for teachers. We're not going to build classroom blocks anymore without teacher accommodation. Every new classroom block, every school must have teacher accommodation. And we'll also accelerate providing accommodation by the existing schools that do not have them. And that will be the Teacher Dabre, it means where teacher will sleep uh, 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 program. 
Um, in consultation with the stakeholders, we would push ahead with the implementation. This has been on the drawing board for a long time. That is 20% basic salary, special allowance for teachers and health workers who accept postings to rural areas. Most of our teachers and health workers don't want to go to rural areas. Everybody wants to serve in the city. And so we're going to map out what we define as rural areas. If you accept posting to go there, you'll get 20% of your basic salary as an incentive, as an allowance to teach in the rural area. Expand infrastructure to ensure prompt employment of nurses and teachers. And so that is also part of it. Assist teachers to own their own vehicles of their choice by offering flexible duty payment arrangements and employer, employer guarantees in partnership with teacher unions and the banking sector. We will encourage teachers to take loans to own their own cars, teachers and other public sector workers. And so your bank will pay for the car. We will deduct it from your salary and pay it straight to the bank. And what we'll do is we will not waive the duty on the vehicle. What we'll do is we'll allow you to pay the duty in small installments until you finish paying the duty so that the car is yours. You'll be using the car while paying bit by bit by bit. I didn't say one CD, two CDs. That would take 1,000 years to pay. But it will be a percentage of your salary that will go towards paying off the uh, cost of the car and the installment payments of the duties. Um, this is going to be the age of the, of the uh, railways. We have paid lip service to building railways for a long time. And this time, we want to make a move on it. It's going to be done by build, operate, and transfer. Because we've been shut out of the international credit market, there's no way we can go on the capital market and borrow to build railway lines. We're going to offer an expression of, of interest, transparent to companies that are willing to invest in our railways, and they will bring the money, they will build the railway lines, and all the revenue will go towards repaying the railway lines. And so if it takes 25 years to repay, they will control it for 25 years. After 25 years, when they have recouped their money, then we'll sit down with them, and then they will transfer the assets to the government of Ghana. And so the western and eastern lines will be connected to the landlocked countries. And so there'll be a line that joins from the western and eastern lines and goes up north to Burkina Faso so that we can send Burkina Faso containers up to their country and we can bring down their cotton and their imports down to the ports for exports. Construct urban intracity railways and BATS rapid transits. The time has come for us to take some of our people off the roads. Uh, many countries are moving in that direction. And so there are light railways that supplement the uh, 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 urban transport system. And so we'll do a feasibility study and see how we can get BOTs to start light uh, transit uh, rail. Um, promoting responsible mining. Ban issuance of new mining leases and activities in forest reserves. We're going to close the forest reserves and get all those Akunta mining and all of them who have desecrated our forest reserves. We are going to march them out of the forest reserves. Some of those trees in the forest reserves are 700, 800, 1,000 years old. And just because you want to take a little gold from there, you go and destroy the whole forest reserve. That is why we are having drought in our country today. That is part of the reason why our cocoa industry is going down, because we're not getting enough rainfall. Because looking for that small gold they will get, they are destroying all the forest reserves and destroying the climate in our country. So those there get ready, start packing your things. After 7 January, if you are not out of the forest reserve, we are going to come and march you out of the forest reserve. We will establish mining cooperatives in all mining districts. We will set up a gold board that will be responsible for buying gold from the small, small scale mining sector. The way, have, the way we have the cocoa board, buying cocoa from the farmers, we'll have a gold board that will buy all the gold from the small scale miners. It will send it to our own refinery to be refined and we'll export refined gold and get all the value addition instead of sending the raw bullion out the way we are currently doing. 
the centralized regulatory licensing and processes for artisanal miners. That is, uh, setting up offices of the Minerals Commission in all mining districts. Implement a blue water initiative to heal and harness the environment. We're going to clean the poisoned waters that have been poisoned by m mining so that we can discharge those waters back into our rivers. We're also going to uh, hide the young people in tree growing. And so in the areas where mining has finished, we will level the ground, close all the holes, and we'll have young boys from the community. We'll pay them a stipend every month. We'll give them a bobo yas. We'll put polytanks in there so that they can plant trees on the mined out land so that we can reclaim the land. Uh, implement, implement a tree for life reafforestation policy. This is what I just talked about. And so we're going to plant commercial trees like cocoa, palm, and rubber on the lands that have been reclaimed. Um, implement a blue water initiative. I just talked about it. So these are just tidbits of uh, what you are going to see in the manifesto. Uh, my running mate and the uh, vice president of the Republic of Ghana to be, Jenana Opokwa Jeman, and other, and other experts will go into more detail in some of the areas that I've touched on. But this is just a tidbit of uh, what we are to see. I'll come back after with the 120-day agenda. That is, when I'm elected on 7th January 2025, within 120 days, I have a social contract with the people of Ghana. I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to do in my first 120 days. Thank you very much.